Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and this podcast is the first of three episodes featuring ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin's interview with Rich Guida, Managing Director of Guida Technology Associates. Today, we'll talk with Rich about his experience with the challenges of implementing data security at large corporations, both in his time as a CISO and now as an independent consultant. Well, my name is Richard Anthony Guida. I'm currently the managing director of a company that my wife and I founded, Guida Technology Associates, and I've been doing consulting work through that company uh, since January of 2011. So, Rich, thanks very much for, for coming along. I mean, it's, it's great to see you again. We've met on a, a number of occasions and talked at uh, quite some length about the different elements of the way in which technology has changed and the implications that's had from a, a security standpoint. I'm interested just to talk about your impression of, of the way in which technology has changed. You know, you've had a lot of experience in the use of it, both in the uh, in the public sector with the Department of the Navy, for instance, more latterly in, in the private sector over a number of years. And so I'm intrigued to see how the different technology tools that you've used in your work have, have changed and, and perhaps some of the challenges you yourself have uh, faced in in ad- adopting some of those and, and indeed, perhaps more importantly, getting people that you've worked with to adopt those. Well, those are uh, those are great questions, Steve, uh, and indeed it is a pleasure seeing you as well. Um well, I, I guess I would start, first of all, I, I, I always like to establish what biases I might have. And my first bias is I look through everything with the prism of information security. Uh, and information security, of course, encapsulates the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. Now, the reason I say that right from the get-go is that naturally one takes a somewhat skeptical view or – skeptical is maybe too strong a word. One takes a view that is a bit hardened with respect to the uses of technology that a typical technology user might not adopt. So most users of technology, uh, and I've seen this over over the years, they adopt the technology, they, as what I like to call, whistle past the graveyard, <laughs> which means um, basically something bad hasn't happened to them, and mm-hmm. so therefore they're fat, dumb, and happy, and they right. enjoy it. It makes their life better, which is good. You know, yep. It makes their lives better. Um, but they don't think about what bad things can happen as a consequence of the use of that technology until the bad things happen. They may even hear news stories about bad things happening to others, but it doesn't relate to them unless it happens to a family member or a good friend or to them themselves. So as a security professional, what I try to do is enlighten people, whether they be lay people or people in enterprises and companies, wherever it might be, I try to enlighten them as to the risks associated with the uses of technology. And those risks have become more and more profound over time. They become profound for several reasons. A lot of devices that used to operate in isolation, such as devices in power plants or in distribution centers or wherever they might be, they used to operate within their own environment, but not connected globally to the internet, not connected to uh, an environment which is much more hostile. Mm-hmm. So. Those same devices, lacking the security protocols and and mechanisms that are built into more modern equipment, are now being exposed to the – have been exposed to the internet. And the consequence of that is a tremendous growth in the vulnerability, you know, kind of uh, spectrum, shall we say. Um, And so I I worry that people don't appreciate that. Uh, There's an old saying in security that you're very familiar with, which is you've got to build security, design security in – at the time that a device or a protocol or a system is designed, at that time. Don't try to uh, tackle it later. Don't try to tack it on as an add-on feature because if you try to do it that way, you're going to miss some subtle elements that could have been eradicated during the design phase, but you're past that phase. Well, that doesn't exist today, okay? It, it, It doesn't exist with historical equipment and devices and protocols. And it also doesn't even exist with many modern pieces of equipment where the rush to get something to market overwhelms the need to do it right from a security standpoint. So if I can get something to market and it appeals to the masses, that's a success. I can make money at that. Later on, if it turns out that device is vulnerable to all sorts of security uh, attacks, all sorts of, of threats, Uh, Who cares? Because it's now in the hands of the consumer. I made my money. I move on. That is a very narrow kind of myopic view, but I've seen that happen over and over and over again. So to answer your question, 
the progression of technology that I that I've observed in my you know having lived on the face of the planet for 150 years, <laughs> uh, the progression of technology that I've observed has been from very isolated types of of activities where security was the need for security was not very profound and security could be employed in a very isolated kind of way and was effective at that in that respect to very interconnected devices, Internet of Things, that sort of thing, where security is an afterthought. It was an afterthought in the first place. Now it's a double afterthought. And the consequence is we have a large spectrum of devices connected to the Internet that actually don't belong being connected to the Internet, but Mm -hmm. they are. And that is a very worrisome, a very fragile situation. Mm. You you mentioned something there, Rich, that intrigued me. You you said, I think, you know, one of the things that you – you do that you enjoy doing is enlightening organizations and people about the risks. Tell me a little bit more about that because that that clearly is something that from a security standpoint, I think people have always struggled with. You know, security professionals have never been very good at enlightening. They've been very good at prevention. They've been very good at handing out tickets and telling people what not to do. But actually, my own philosophy is that that we need to move very much more quickly into that age of enlightenment, if I, if I could put it that way. So, so tell us about uh, some of your experiences there. Well, certainly. You said it very eloquently, and I completely concur with your observation there. Um, enlightenment, in my view, takes several forms. The first form is making sure that the people in the enterprise understand, as I said earlier, the full spectrum of what information security covers, confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, of data. Oftentimes, they understand intrinsically what confidentiality means. It means only giving access to the data to people who need to see it, who have who are authorized to see it. Availability, likewise, suggests sort of a very common way of thinking of continuity of business operations. I want to make sure data is available when needed in order to support a business process. Integrity is often misunderstood. They don't get that. And integrity means, of course, the data is authentic and it has not been altered in an unauthorized or unexpected way. Um, Sometimes the alteration can occur accidentally. It doesn't even have to be deliberate alteration. Mm -hmm. But either way, they don't understand the integrity piece. So when you lay out that that is the full spectrum of information security, what I've observed is most executives' eyes tend to open a bit wider because they used to think of business continuity as something that was done by the business continuity group. They didn't realize That's part of information security. The next piece is tying together what the leadership believes to be things that the enterprise should worry about when it comes to information security versus what the security professionals or the IT staff believes. And this is where I've found the biggest disconnects. The enlightenment phase there really is not just saying, okay, we're the information security professionals. We think we know what the problems are, what the risks are, and we're just going to go educate everybody else because we know everything, okay? I wouldn't say that information security professionals are quite that, uh, how best to put it, they're not quite that arrogant Mm -hmm. usually, but there can be that tinge of, you know, I'm the doctor, you're the patient, I know what's wrong with you, just listen to me and you'll be fine, okay? As opposed to the approach that I prefer to take and the approach that I've taken with my clients, I took it at J&J, which is you listen to the executives first. And so the principle there is hear from them, what are they worried about? Once you explain what information security covers, You put them on the couch. You're their therapist. They're your patient. You ask them what keeps them up at night with respect to information security. Once they've told you that and you've assembled a a full picture of what's keeping everybody up at night at the executive level, then you translate those worries, those areas of concern into information security risks. That's where the security professional steps in and says, okay, I've heard what you've had to say. Let me now convert this into a risk or into a set of risks. You then go back and say, okay, I've converted your areas of concern into risks. And by the way, some of your areas of concern you don't really need to worry about because you're maybe unaware of mitigations or other things that we have in place, or you just may not be thinking right about something. Conversely, there are other things you're not worried about that you really should be worrying about. So it teases out this kind of disconnect between what they worry about versus what they should worry about. Once you've done that and you've constructed this set of risks from their areas of concern, then you can go come up with mitigations or proposed actions to deal with those risks. But the most important element of that is when you are constructing those risks and you now ask for money to abate those risks or mitigate those risks, you can tie back the money you're asking for, the resources you're asking for, to what they told you. So 
Here's a risk. It's a high risk. It relates to something you told me, Mr. or Ms. Executive. I need money now or resources to go fix it. So you have a choice. Either give me the money to fix it or you conclude maybe then you're not as worried about it as you thought you were. And that's okay. As an information security professional, I want there to be informed decisions. I'm not trying to uh, impose my will upon you know, some, uh, some other party. I want there to be an informed decision. Now, when I do it the way I've described it to you, almost never do the executives say, yeah, we've had second thoughts and we'll not fund this particular mm-hmm. mitigation. Almost always they will say, yeah, okay, we get it. We were worried about that. This is a risk. We get it. We'll fund it. Maybe not quite as much money as one might like, but they'll fund, they'll fund some measures to deal with the issue. So that, that to me is the most important piece. You have to tie together what the executives are worried about to what you can then operationalize as an information security professional. That's the enlightenment. You're enlightening the execs. Once the execs are enlightened, getting the rest of the staff enlightened is an easier chore. I don't say it's easy, but it's an easier chore because they take their marching orders from their leadership. Yeah, and I suppose it's it's really in that that element, I think, that the focus – really needs to switch today, I would say. I I think that perhaps what information security professionals have been relatively good at is coming up the curve on that one, understanding how to position it within the enterprise. The challenge that I see is that we are moving increasingly towards an environment where the end user is king. It is all about the smartphone. It is all about the tablet. I want to be able to use the same technology in my workplace as I do in my kitchen. And by the way, don't bother me with any of this security nonsense because it works, right? And Mm -hmm. it's not my responsibility anyway because that's something that you, the enterprise, need to be concerned about. And so whilst I think we could probably give ourselves, I don't know, maybe a a six or seven out of ten in terms of, of being able to reach out to the executive, where we now need to shift our attention is much more to the end user. And yes, you're right. They do take marching orders but only to an extent. And and it is, for me, this graying out of, of the kitchen and, and, the, uh, and the workplace that um, is really going to cause us some, some problems. So uh, tell me about perhaps how we can confront that. I mean, you, you know we've talked before that certain ISF members have adopted a- approaches to doing that by perhaps looking at, you know, staying safe at home, keeping kids off the internet and, or off certain sites on the internet. But we need to go much further than that, don't we? No, absolutely. Again, your, your comments are spot on. Um, what I would observe is that the executive, the reason I was so focused on discerning the concerns of the executives first and translating them into, the, into risks is the very point that you just raised about is there a clear understanding among the executives as to the risks associated with the bring your own device or use your own device mentality that, again, that you very artfully described. And oftentimes there is not because the executives themselves want to use their own devices and do use their own devices. And they do so uh, sometimes, I wouldn't say in a haphazard, but an unthoughtful way. So getting them to appreciate the risks associated with such activities is a very first important step. And that's why I use this, for lack of a better way to say it, a Socratic process of teasing out their concerns by asking questions, not telling them they should worry about it, asking them, are they worried about it? And then you will find, I, I've found when I hear that, some, some of them are very aware that there are a lot of risks, but there are big benefits, true. Others are less aware of the risks, and they become aware of the risks when you tease out that they tell you, I, I'm not really worried about that. Should I be? And then you explain, well, yeah, here's why you probably should be, okay? But that kind of Socratic engagement is so much different than telling them you should be worried about X without even having heard from them first, you know, what, what it is that's on top of mind. Now, to your question. Once you've gotten that kind of zeitgeist, okay, the kind of mindset that says, you know, maybe this is something we should be worried about, the answer then to the question you raised isn't that we stop using BYO, you know, bring your own devices, because that's not going to happen. Clearly, there will continue to be widespread use of such devices. Mm -hmm. But what it means is, and what I've done with many clients is, I lay out, all right, if this is a big risk, which we believe it to be, and people are going to do it, which we know they will, okay, (laughs) and we don't want to stop them because that would be a big impact on the company, then what are the technical measures that we can put in place that are reasonably transparent to the users that won't interfere with them getting their jobs done and yet will protect our enterprise, our resources, our network, you know, our servers, et cetera. And there are several things that can be done in that respect. 
ranging from if I connect to the network with a device that has an unrecognized MAC address or is unrecognized as an asset given to uh, the employee or the contractor by the company, so I connect that way, it's an unrecognized address, I now impose certain controls over where that device can go, what, at what resources it can access. I may take a look at that device remotely without having an agent on the device to see whether it's patched and up-to-date. Does it have a firewall operating? If it doesn't, I may alert the security staff or even alert the user that, you know, you haven't patched this device in forever, and you probably want to do that because we may not allow you to come on the network again next time if you don't get it patched, or we may put you in a quarantine zone until you patch it. So, yes, that has some impact on the user, but, of course, that's a good impact in the sense that it gets them to do something they should have done on their device anyway. Um, so those are just a couple of measures. There are certainly other measures. You could enforce two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication if the device is untrusted. You could um, restrict the download of large files. If this is not a company-owned device, you can go to your email, you can do certain things, but if you ever try to download a gigabyte of file or something, I'm sorry, there will be a message that will say, you're not permitted to do it. This is not a company-owned device. You're going to have to use a company-owned device to do that. Now, when these types of things happen, you know, when you impose those kind of restrictions, and some of them could bite a little bit, okay, mm -hmm. a couple questions suggest themselves. One is you want to make sure there are no workarounds because if people can sort of get around the controls that you put in place, then, you know, you've created cognitive dissonance, which, by the way, I, I despise cognitive dissonance where you tell people one thing and you do something else, okay? Mm -hmm. That is just absolutely it, – it eats at the core of an organization, any enterprise. Right. So you don't want to create a cognitive dissonance kind of situation. But what you do want to do is encourage people, if they have a need to do something that you're preventing them from doing, then they, there needs to be a clear path for them to articulate what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it, why it's important for them to do it, so that you can then assess that and say, let's find a way to solve that problem, okay? Um, at J&J, at &J, we had that, and at many companies that I'm consulting with uh, subsequently, they are very candid in terms of making it clear to users, if we prevent you from doing something for a security reason, you can't get to a website because the web filtering rules are preventing you to get from getting to that website. If you have something that prevents, here's the ombudsman, in essence. Here's the place you can go to register your concern, and we will address it quickly. And we, now, in some cases, we may tell you, sorry, but we can't. We just can't do it. In other cases, it might be get your supervisor to approve, get somebody else to approve, We'll write an exception. We'll allow your particular device to go there because you're doing research and it's important that you, you know, go to a, a website that J&J, uh, &J, we used to have this problem all the time. You put in the word breast, right? Okay, the, all the filters go off. You can't get out to the internet. Well, these are researchers doing breast cancer research. Mm -hmm. So we've changed their filter rules to right. allow them to go to locations that would otherwise be proscribed if you were just a warehouse, uh, you know, worker. That's the kind of tuning, the better way to the way I would describe it is you're tuning the controls to the work environment and to the type of worker, to what he or she is doing, what he or she needs to do. You're tuning the controls to that type of person, and that gives them the flexibility to do what they want under the rules that you've established. And, and these sorts of things are quite easy to do. I mean, that that's the beauty of them, isn't it? And I think that you make a very valid point that transparency is, is so very important. You know, if people can understand why we're doing certain things and they can understand, as you rightly point out, the process that they can go through, then to have things changed, then we're part way there. May I just interject, I apologize, yeah. just to interject one thought, because I, again, I'm, I'm in violent agreement with you, as, <laughs> as always, okay? Uh, but the thing I just wanted to interject is, at J&J, &J, we had, you know, we had security policies that were very complex, very long, et cetera, but we also entertained, as I was describing, waivers, exceptions. Mm -hmm. We had 120, on average, between 120 and 140 waivers every year that we processed, and mo almost all of them were approved with appropriate controls and, and uh, uh, with appropriate consideration. I say that because I had more than one person in the executive leaders, leadership roles say, my gosh, we have 120 to 140 waivers to our policies? What the heck? Okay, that sounds like something is really uh, amiss. And I told him, no, if anything, this is an indication of a healthy system. This is like saying, you know, I'm a human. I get all these germs that come into me and my system reacts to all of them, okay? 
I want that to be the case. If we had no waivers, that would mean people are either not reading the policies mm-hmm. or they're ignoring them or they have workarounds or, you know, that sort of thing. You always want to have some some uh, degree of kind of uh, you know, disconnect, shall we say, between what the business wants to do and what your policies say. Because then you can adjust your policies, you can process the waivers. So it was really a very – it was an indication of a healthy system, not a mm-hmm. sick system, even though some people perceived it that way. And this is one of those things that used to drive me nuts about, about companies. In the Navy, waivers, this sort of thing, very common. In fact, we, people were encouraged, the sailors, the officers, encouraged to bring to the attention of leadership things that were problematic. In a lot of companies, it's like, oh, no, no, we don't want to hear any of that stuff. We just want everything to work nice and smoothly, and we don't want to hear about any discord or discontent or disagreements, none of that. That drove me nuts, okay? Mm -hmm. Because disagreement, constructive disagreement is so critical to any kind of work you do, especially in the security area. That's part of intellectual honesty, being honest with what you're doing and not just pulling a wool over people's eyes because you don't want people to seem like they're disagreeing. Uh, that, that's just wrong-headed. So I'm sorry for the interruption. No, no, it, it, it's a very good point. That was the first of our three-part conversation with Richard Guida, Managing Director of Guida Technology Associates. I'm sure many of our members can relate to his descriptions of the challenges of being a CISO. Be sure to listen for our second episode in this series of Conversations with Rich, in which we focus on data security and the Internet of Things. To find more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org.